Good morning. Let's do a review for chapters 4 and 6 out of the Isham textbook for microbiology for central service technicians and the infection control chapter, chapter 6. So what you should know by now um, for the pending final is that uh, we have a responsibility in CS to protect our patients from infectious diseases. And we also have a responsibility to protect ourselves from infectious diseases. Um, you should know what the definitions of microbiology and contamination are. We deal with contamination. Even the contamination that you cannot see on objects, we believe it is there, and so we protect ourselves and our patients by removing it and handling it very carefully. <clears throat> you should know from Chapter 4 the conditions that microorganisms need to live and grow. And you should also know how they're transmitted and how microorganisms can be controlled and eliminated. It's important that we eliminate the microorganisms from our environment and from the surgical instruments and the equipment and we don't let it get on ourselves <clears throat> when we're in decontamination. Okay, how are microorganisms transmitted? Microorganisms are transmitted by fomites, which are inanimate objects. They can be transmitted from animal to human. Um, the animal or a uh, perhaps an insect would be a vector. And they can be transmitted through food or water. This is common vehicle. So a fomite, an example of a fomite that applies for us is a piece of um, medical equipment or a surgical instrument. It is an inanimate object that can transmit bacteria. And then an example of a vector would be perhaps a, uh, a fly or a um, cockroach or a rat or a bat or a cat or a squirrel. Okay, these are vectors. And then common vehicle infections. A common vehicle is uh, something that can contaminate, or I'm sorry, in fact, uh, a large number of people. So think contaminated romaine lettuce that has the E. coli on it, or salmonella in chicken. Um, this is common vehicle. Or how about HIV in blood? HIV in blood is a common vehicle infection. Okay, moving on. Some basics about microorganisms. Uh, let's talk about the bacteria. A bacteria has a control center called the nucleus that is made up of a strand of DNA. This is the control center of the microorganism and it uh, determines how the microorganism acts, how it looks, how it can become resistant to antibiotics, and whether or not it has a flagella when it replicates again by binary fission. Binary fission is how a bacteria replicates. So you have one bacteria, which become two bacterias, which then become four bacterias, which then can become eight bacterias. Every 20 minutes, given optimum conditions for growth, a bacteria can replicate every 20 minutes. So, um, that's pretty quick, given optimal conditions for growth. And uh, that action is called binary fission. Okay, not all bacteria are pathogenic to humans. Pathogenic means, if you break the word down, disease, origin of. Pathogens are the ones that can actually cause us to become sick. Um, these bacteria can be classified as mesophiles. A mesophile likes the middle temperature ranges which our body temperature happens to fall in. And that temperature range is, um, if you look on page, yes, 76 of your book, the temperature range for mesophiles is 68 to 113 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, however, thermophiles, like 122 to 158 degree temperatures, we would die at those temperatures, and then we would also die <clears throat> at the temperatures the psychrophiles need to exist, which is 59 to 68. So, bacteria actually do need to have the correct temperature range for them as individuals. 
Um, bacteria can be measured in microns. A micron is one twenty-five thousandth of an inch or one one thousandth of a millimeter. So this is very small. You can only see something that small with a magnifier uh, microscope that is capable of magnifying 900 times or greater. <coughs> bacteria can be classified as uh, by shape as a coccus or a bacillus or a spirilla. A spirilla looks kind of spirally. A bacillus kind of looks like a, a Tic Tac or a macaroni. Um, those are rod shaped. And then the coccus are spherical, like a ball or a grape. And uh, some bacteria are capable of going into a self-preservation state called endospore or simply called spore. A spore is capable of protecting itself by encasing its nucleus with a hard crust. Spores are the most difficult to kill. Vegetative organisms or bacteria can be uh, destroyed pretty easily with uh, intermediate to low disinfectants, depending on the bacteria, and uh, also high level disinfectants. If there were no endospores, we would not need sterilization methods, basically. But there are, and so we do. We can also classify bacteria by their ability to become stained or not become stained. So if we can stain a bacteria with crystal violet and upon attempting to rinse it in the gram staining procedure um, and it retains the stain, the crystal violet purple stain, then it is known as a gram positive bacteria. However, if we are able to remove the stain and then countersane it with a safranin, then it is known as a gram-negative bacteria. Uh, chart on page 74, you should know that Clostridium difficile, Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, and Enterococcus, as well as Mycobacterium tuberculosis and Mycobacterium leprae are all gram-positive bacteria. There are some listed that are like E. coli, and Salmonella typhi, which causes typhus, that are gram-negative bacteria. Okay, another way to identify bacteria by their ability to uh, stain is the Zeal-Nielsen acid fast test, and that is outlined on page 75. Now, another way to classify bacteria is whether or not they need oxygen. Bacteria that need oxygen in their environment are called aerobic, like air, aerobic. Um, and the ones that need to have oxygen removed or simply don't need oxygen are called anaerobic, which means without air. Um, some anaerobic bacteria that are a concern are, you've probably heard of these, Clostridium tetani, which causes tetanus. If you've ever stepped on a nail and you've been taken to the doctor's office to get a tetanus shot, this is the bacteria that causes tetanus. Or if you've ever been told not to purchase or open and use a can of some kind of food product that uh, the can was sort of puffing out, um, this is because the Clostridium botulinum that can exist without oxygen survived the canning process and is growing inside. Okay, we've already covered the psychophiles, mesophiles, and thermophiles, and no, I did not touch my face. <clears throat> so, bacteria need to have the proper uh, pH level for them. Um, the ones that happen to be pathogenic to us, no surprise here, like the pH of our bodies, which is um, anywhere between 7 and 7.8. However, some that are used in like the production of food for perhaps sauerkraut would like different pHs. Sauerkraut bacteria like a pH that is more acidic. Um, excuse me. The vegetative stage, angstrom, you should know these terms, pH, psychophiles, mesophile, thermophiles, and binary fission. Know those terms. Now, on to 
Multidrug resistant organisms. These are a concern for us in this world. Um, overuse and misuse of antibiotics have given us a rise in resistant organisms. Um, if they survive the onslaught of the antibiotics, then they have um, shown resistance to the antibiotics and they have, uh, they continue to reproduce by binary fission and then we have colonies and colonies of resistant microorganisms. Some of these are MRSA, BRE, Klebsiella, those are on page 77. Um, MRSA can exist on our skin, in our nasal passages, in our ears, in our hair, and it's not really a concern to us unless it gets into our bodies. Um, not through the mouth. It's okay if, if an MRSA bacteria gets into your mouth, but into your skin, into the normally sterile places. Um, BRE exists in our bowels and it can make you very sick. There are other microorganisms that are not bacteria, such as the virus. A virus is about a thousand times smaller than a bacteria, and they can only be seen on a scanning electron microscope. Viruses, we hear a lot about those lately. Um, there's even some debate as to whether or not a virus is alive. I go with the side that says they're not because it doesn't fit the definition. A virus does not have any uh, any of its own DNA. It, it's a copy. It's a copy machine that makes uh, copies of itself. It cannot uh, really um, exist without a host. A, bac or a bacteria can exist without a host. Actually, for years in this poor state, a virus needs to have a host. Some viruses can live uh, for days, hours, weeks, minutes outside of a host. Viruses can be transmitted by food or water, and some of these are the ones that cause acute viral gastroenteritis. Um, a rotavirus, a norovirus, and noro-like viruses. <clears throat> so these viral infections often have symptoms that are similar to bacterial infections. However, they're viruses, and they're spread by the four Fs, food, feces, fingers, and flies. Um, some viruses, like Herpes simplex virus can survive in a dry state for one and a half to four hours on toilet seats, or up to 72 hours on cotton gauze and 18 hours on plastic. Viruses take many different shapes. Uh, they always look like something from another universe. <clears throat> then there's the protozoans. The protozoa are uh, included amoebas and uh, some other protozoans such as uh, entomedi Entomoeba histolica which is found in feces and uh, intestinal ulcers and liver abscesses and uh, there's cryptosporidium which is another protozoan that can cause diarrhea and abdominal pain this organism causes severe life-threatening diarrhea and AIDS or cancer patients and organ transplant recipients. So remember our responsibility is toward our patients, many of whom are already compromised, um, compromised immune systems, maybe young or old. Fungi are a large, fungi. They are a large group of plant-like um, organisms that include molds and mushrooms and things like this. Um, we actually get penicillin from fungus and there's some other uh, antibiotics that can be made from fungus. Some fungus can target the hair and nails. Some fungus um, we eat, mushrooms. There's something called black mold that can be growing in a, in a very damp place. If you see black mold growing um, just know that it is actually very toxic to you. Okay, moving on to prions. Prion is an infectious protein particle, an infectious particle of protein that, unlike a virus, contains no nucleic acid, does not trigger an immune response, 
and is not destroyed by extreme heat or cold. We don't have the means at this point in history to effectively um, sterilize instruments that were contaminated with prions. Prions can be transferred from patient to patient on surgical instruments. So say patient A has brain surgery and there's prions on those instruments and they go through the routine sterilization process. Those prions um, can infect patient B. So prions are a special concern. Prions are the cause of things like mad cow, um, chronic wasting disease, which you might have heard of called zombie deer, and CJD, which is Crutchfield Jacobs disease. Now CJD is very bad. It causes a wasting away of the brain tissue <clears throat> in humans. It's a uh, transmissible spongiform encephalopathy and tissue samples from brains of infected persons show tiny little holes appearing in the tissues and so obviously this is going to be very bad for brains. Now I want to point out here that <clears throat> with the exception of CJD all of our sterilization processes, our cleaning and sterilization processes should be capable of handling all of the other organisms. <clears throat> and so standard procedures are um, in place for everything but CJD. You will probably have a special policy or procedure in your department for handling CJD. If somebody tells you, hey, these instruments were used on a CJD patient, get the supervisor um, and follow the policies on how to deal with those. And it may just end up with a destruction of the instruments. CJD affects the, um, one person per million worldwide and approximately 200 cases seen in the U.S. each year. Page 83, the last page I want to go over. Um, there's a question here. It says, if you receive a case from the OR to the decontamination area, that has a note stating that the instruments are contaminated with hepatitis B or MRSA. How will you handle the instruments? Now, with the exception of CJT, all instruments will be handled the same, which is you're going to go by the instrument manufacturer's instructions for use on all cleaning and um, disinfecting or sterilization of those instruments. So, in other words, you just do what you always do, with the exception of CJT. Okay, I'm going to end this here, and then I'm going to um, upload another about uh, Chapter 6, Infection Prevention. Thank you. Just need to get my cursor back over there.